Um, next speaker is Urban Jackson, uh, Deputy CEO of the Climate Institute. Um, uh, his involvement in, in climate change policy is, uh, is longer than that of most of us. Uh, I think this is almost two decades, right? Uh, it's more than two decades, okay? You ought to update your website. Um, <laughs> He's represented various non-governmental group and advised government and business nationally, regionally, international for. He's a regular uh, at the climate change uh, conferences internationally, at the COPs, um, and his organization, of course, is, is very, very prolific in, in providing timely information and analysis uh, pertaining to these issues. Erwin. Uh, thank you, Frank, and, and, and thank you for the invitation to come along today. Um, I won't dwell on uh, who the Climate Institute is because uh, most of you here I guess will probably know, but what I wanted to touch on was um, some of the themes that have already been brought out in previous conversations and I thought I'd start with, um, from our point of view, the conversation about our post-2020 target is not just a decision about what we do in 2025 or 2030. It's, it's an opportunity for us as a country to start thinking about what is the long-term direction or strategic policy objectives which we want to achieve as a country. Um, and you would hope that, when, and I would hope actually, that when we have the conversation, whether when it comes from the Climate Change Authority's report and the work that the PM's task group are doing, is we actually start to open up that conversation and stop, stop thinking about the next five years and start thinking about the next 50. Um, because that becomes really important in terms of how you define your national interest. And if I think back over the last 20 odd years of climate diplomacy or climate action um, in Australia, there's in some respects, not a lot of difference, regardless of what colour of government. Um, there has always been a very strong desire from Australian governments to maximise participation in any global agreement um, and for Australia to have the maximum amount of flexibility that it can in meeting its commitments. And that can be through, until recently, um, all shades of governments have pushed very hard for access to international markets as part of your way to, to meet your commitments. Um, we've seen historically a very strong um, pushing the Australian government to ensure that the land sector is appropriately accounted for in international <coughs> negotiations and accounting so that countries can maximise and reduce emissions across all parts of their economy. But I think there are two different ways in which in, in the, the government beyond that has, has approached um, this, this, this whole idea. And the first one I'll characterise is the Kyoto period. Um, and this was sort of the period probably up until around 2007. And it wasn't just conservative governments, it was also dominated by the Keating government at the time as well, which was that our overall national interest was dominated by a view that the approach we took to climate change was really about protecting our mission intensive trade um, export industries. And I can give some examples about that if people are interested. But there was a change in the Kyoto period, which in part was sparked by, I think, um, the Ghana review and, and previous work that had been done, um, both outside and within government, which which comes to the issue that many people have raised already, which is a recognition that Australia is incredibly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And that itself needs to be considered in how we define our approach to the international process. And we FOI'd the government um, just after Copenhagen and drew, and we got a lot of information about the kind of approach that the government took to engaging with other countries in advance of Copenhagen. And it is actually quite clear, to be fair to them at the time, they were actually not only looking for maximum participation from countries, they were looking for the maximum amount of effort that they should be making in their new contributions. Whether it be in terms of their engagement with Japan, New Zealand, Russia, China, it wasn't just a question of you need to participate in Copenhagen, but you need to find a way to come forward with a more ambitious target. Um, which then leads me to the, to the next point about the key considerations that you might consider in that context for what our INDC might be. The first is of all attention, vulnerability to climate change. And the first implication of that is what we're trying to achieve is not participation, not just participation from all major emitters. We're also looking for ambition from all major emitters. The second part, which is another key consideration, is actually what's emerging in terms of the international framework. And I agree with probably about 80% of what Peter was talking about in terms of what we're likely to see and what the key issues are in Paris. But I think if you look at the Paris outcome, it's got, there's a very narrow political bandwidth of what can be achieved in Paris. Um, it's fairly, I think, it will be very difficult and there will be lots of fireworks, but you can probably see, broadly speaking, what Paris is going to look like. And it is going to be a world which creates top-down expectations, but also is driven by bottom-up contributions. And if you accept as a basic premise that Australia's interest is in avoiding two degrees, then what we're interested in is creating norms internationally and using the Paris outcomes and the contribution we make to create norms where action to avoid two degrees is the, is the norm, not the exception. So if, they, if, we, if we want that, and if that is the outcome that we want, then we ourselves need to be putting forward action consistent with two degrees. 
Some people have already touched on, of course, we need to consider the economic cost, but we also need to consider the benefits. And the key point we continue to make and will continue to make is both the economic cost and the benefit of your action is not determined largely by your national targets. That's largely determined by the domestic policies you put in place, but it's also influenced by whether you're accessing international markets, um, but it's also influenced by the actions of other countries. As past economic analysis in Australia has shown, a proportion of the impact that we suffer from global action on climate change comes from the actions of other countries, not from our own action. And I think that the final point that we need to consider in setting it is that despite the noise that we're going to see in Paris, Paris is not going to be perfect, it is going to be a, a step forward, but the world is actually starting to change and, and all the trends are pointing in the one direction and all that, that direction is towards decarbonisation ultimately becoming inevitable. And if you're not setting up a policy framework which is actually factoring that in, then that policy framework will never be stable. Because the only way in the long term we're going to create stable policy in a framework and get over all the issues that business continue to argue about, we need more predictability, we need more certainty, ultimately the only way that we see that can be delivered is through a credible domestic policy that drives decarbonisation. Um, Anthony's put up a very similar graph to this, I'm not going to deal with it in detail, but we put out a paper at the end of last year suggesting what Australia's IND she should be. Um, we suggest a 2025 target, we think that maximises flexibility. Um, but what I want to focus here, not so much as on the numbers, but also on the framework, which is just reinforcing what Anthea was talking about. We need a, a coordinated set of goals and we should be advancing a coordinated set of goals that don't just look to 2025 or 2030, but signal a longer term direction and the end point or the strategic goal, which I've been talking about, which we want to achieve. Um, but the other thing I wanted to highlight here is this little red dot um, up here. And I, I've stuck this in recently, it's not in the paper we published, but because that gives you an indication of where the current commitments of other countries currently are whether they be the US, the Europeans, um, the Swiss, the Norwegians, and the others who have already indicated what their national targets are. And the reason I put that up is it really illustrates there's no free lunch. Even if we wanted to be comparable to what other advanced economies are doing, and they're not, most of them not doing enough, um, it's still a significant reduction after 2020. Um, so there's no way we ultimately we're going to get away from this. And this is important in terms of even the Lima outcome, which says we need to progress in our new target. The other point about this red dot is it's broadly consistent with a three degree world. So even if the government decided to accept that we think three degrees is okay or even four degrees is okay, you're still looking at very significant emission reductions post 2020. So finally, I think this is where, where I think this is actually quite an exciting time. Like we've been through a viral malaise in climate policy over the last few years. It's been really tough, it's really been really difficult. But we have an opportunity to do a reset button and the post-2020 target is an opportunity to do that, to have a sensible conversation about where we want to go in the long term. Um, if we set a target which is defined by the national interest in avoiding two degrees, then we can do a few things. We can support our national interest by creating international norms that through, through time increase both participation but increasingly ambition of other countries. We can balance short-term action with our long-term strategic goals by setting short and long-term targets and ultimately, we can also provide this greater policy stability to actually get the investment going that we're going to need to achieve any of these outcomes. So that's what I finally wanted to say, but given that people have raised it already, I'll just put this slide up. This summarises all the economic modelling that's been done in Australia for the last 10 years. It shows a very similar, very, very basic picture. Economy keeps growing, emissions come down. Thank you. <laughs>